Now for any Star Trek fans in the, in the room, you may be a bit of that name that's familiar. And uh, essentially we're nerds, and Spock was the guy who would go to a new world, would pull out a mobile device, and scan the area for cool things to go check out, which is what we built. Um, we store and search vast amounts of location information at a level of speed, scale and efficiency that we think is game changing and is ready for the next big wave in not just mobile but internet things. This all started with the smartphone and uh, it's a generation defining invention. Uh, but how do actually, you know, what actually is it? I kind of define it as pocket-sized computer with access to the internet. Sure, it's got apps, but its real strength is in connectivity. So, okay, what about mobile 2.0? More connectivity, I'd say. Uh, it's always connected. Um, it's the central device, a hub of network of smaller devices. It could be personal ones, or it could be ones that you interact with as you move around the world. And we know connectivity is going to increase. Uh, <laughs> Wi-Fi and LTE coverage is, is, is always getting wider. Um, projects like uh, Google Loon, which are uh, putting uh, high altitude balloons and uh, bringing uh, wild connectivity to rural areas. Um, and also, they've just invested a billion dollars into SpaceX, so you want to put uh, hundreds of um, small low Earth orbit satellites to essentially um, give these devices truly ubiquitous all that broadband. And with all these devices connected all the time, they're going to be always reporting information. And information is valuable when it is attached to a context. And the biggest context here is location. So you have these uh, billions of devices supplying location information constantly. And hopefully we've managed to uh, solve the problems of uh, battery capacity, so wireless charging. I mean, Tesla did this hundreds of years ago, so hopefully we can get there soon. Um, maybe things like liquid batteries, but there's a lot of people working on this area. Now, as, as was mentioned in the intro, my actual background is computer science, so I've recently finished my PhD at Cambridge, uh, where I was working on building a uh, custom supercomputer to do real-time simulation of the brain. And the brain is quite interesting because it has 100 billion neurons with 100 trillion synapses. And when you think about the Internet of Things, that has billions of devices with possibly trillions of connections. And actually, get, when you come to neural networks, the biggest uh, problem with systems at scale is communication. And I think that's going to be an issue with the Internet of Things as well. The data moving around the system is going to be a big problem. But once you've solved those problems, what does it actually allow? I think you start to see the emergence of uh, location-based services, but really that's the start of the on-demand economy. We're seeing mobile apps at the moment, like Uber and Halo, which are um, personal transport on demand. Um, you've got Zipcar, which is rent a car on demand. Um, apps like CityMapper, which is get me from A to B. I don't care how I get there, just get me there as fast as possible. And just-in-time logistics, like Deliveroo. And everything is basically allowing the user to interact with the world in a much simpler way, and that's more intuitive. And you've got services like Google Now, which is, I'd say, one of the pinnacles of smart services at the moment. It's getting information to the right person, at the right place, at the right time. And it's actually a lot smarter than that. It's, it's using location, your current location, your future calendar, and also using machine learning. So these things like it knows that your flight's delayed, so it's already informed your taxi company to delay picking you up. It's amazing, and, and, and things with uh, eye beacons and, and geofencing techniques, uh, the location side of things is actually becoming more uh, integrated into the services themselves. Now we've talked about gaming a lot today, and uh, this is kind of, I see this as one of the, the, the modern things. This, these are what the teenagers of today are seeing. If you actually look at this screen for just a minute and you imagine the sheer amount of information that's there, I mean, the bottom left hand corner you've, you've got a map which is a live feed of all of your friends, or teammates, and some enemies on there too. But that's essentially live GPS feeds. And you've also got this augmented reality overlay which says where the objectives are and, and what's dangerous in your environment. Now, obviously, we start with military context because you know, that's where GPS started, and then you move to the commercial side of things. 
Well, this is, I see this as the beginning of the augmented reality, okay, admittedly in a virtual world, but this is an information layer. And at the moment, you've just seen the cusp of it, but there's about to be an emergence of the intelligence layer as well. And on the side of the commercial side of things, you've got Oculus Rift, which is uh, virtual reality gaming. It's a bit impractical, but they got bought by Facebook for two billion, and it wasn't for gaming. I'll tell you that. Um, they're really trying to do what Google did with Google Glass, um, which is bring the intelligence layer to the real world, so everyone can see, see and interact with it. Now, there was some pushback on this, which is kind of surprising. Um, a lot of people thought they were being filmed by people wearing glasses. And they got the nickname Glass Holes, um, which was uh, kind of I don't know whether that was because it was $1,500 and it was some socioeconomic uh, factors involved as well, but it was interesting that I was in America. I don't think that would have happened in the UK since the amount of security cameras that are around were always being filmed, so maybe we we're just more, more comfortable about it. But the funny thing is, the people that were complaining about these devices were young techies who knew what they were. And those same techies will go home and publish pictures to Facebook and Twitter of themselves. So it's kind of strange. I think it's a step in the right direction, but it was definitely ahead of its time. Uh, and this is sort of breaking news. I don't know if you've seen this last week. Uh, Microsoft uh, released HoloLens, um, which is just fantastic. It's, uh, it potentially tricks your brain into seeing that the lights matter. Um, so it allows you to do things like this. <laughs> So you actually see these overlays, and you can start seeing step-by-step -step guides on how to interact with the physical world. And I see this as, as the intelligence layer coming in, into its practice. Now again, maybe this is a bit ahead of its time as well, and so more consumers are kind of stuck with wearables. And this is, again, mentioning with the, the network and the, the smartphone being at the centre of that network. These devices very rarely happen on their own, and it's less obtrusive and can be used without people, uh, offending people. But the trick is here is that everything, that, every technology that is being adapted by users, it just works. Um, convenience and usability always wins. And you, younger users have grown up um, with, with this technology and they're less concerned about privacy. Uh, we know it's public and, and global and either we don't care or we know how to use it. So yeah, Facebook is to your friends, Twitter is to the world, uh, Pinterest. Well, that's, that's fine, everyone's kind of happy with your taste. But if you really want to get private messaging, you can kind of use the Snapchat. So it's the right tools for the right job. And I think there's a hell of a lot more innovation that's needed all across the, the stack. Um, I think uh, ubiquitous connectivity is coming along there, but still more work needed. We need to solve the battery life problem to actually get the internet of things off the ground. And I think location-based services with uh, contextual intelligence um, can really add a lot of value to this, this tech stack. Um, but I think it's a very exciting time, and that's um, set and done. Thank you very much. <laughs>